Welcome to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today's topic is 2.2 Communities and Ecosystems. This important topic in ESS helps us understand how living organisms interact with each other and with their environment. Let's get into it. In ESS, a community is a group of populations living and interacting with each other in a common habitat. Think about a watering hole in Africa where zebras, elephants, and various antelope species all gather. They form a community by sharing the space and influencing each other's lives through competition, through predation, and other interactions. An ecosystem takes this concept even further by including both the community and the physical environment with which those communities interact. This coral reef ecosystem includes not just the turtle, the fish, and the coral organisms, but also the water, the sunlight, the ocean currents, the density of salt in the water, and all of those things shape the existence of the organisms that live there. Ecosystems are remarkably complex. This diagram shows a temperate forest food web with multiple interconnected feeding relationships. Notice how organisms participate in different food webs simultaneously. Some feeding on living plant material in a grazing food web, and others are consuming detritus in a decomposition food web. A significant idea in this topic is that photosynthesis and respiration play really important roles in the flow of energy through communities. This diagram illustrates how energy flows through an ecosystem while matter cycles within it. Energy enters as sunlight, it passes through various organisms, and it ultimately exits as heat. Photosynthesis and respiration are essentially opposite reactions. In photosynthesis, plants convert carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen using light energy. In respiration, organisms break down glucose with oxygen to release energy producing carbon dioxide and water as byproducts. When analyzing these processes as systems, you need to identify inputs, outputs, and transformations. For photosynthesis, inputs include light energy, carbon dioxide, and water. The outputs are glucose and oxygen. The transformation occurs within chloroplasts, converting light energy to chemical energy that's stored in glucose. Respiration can be described similarly as a system. The inputs to respiration are glucose and oxygen. Its outputs are carbon dioxide, water, and the energy released from respiration. The transformation occurs primarily in cellular mitochondria. Understanding these processes as systems helps us analyze the flow of energy through ecosystems. During respiration, large amounts of energy are dissipated or lost as heat, and this increases entropy or disorganization in the ecosystem. However, this energy release enables organisms to maintain their highly organized structures with relatively low entropy. This follows the second law of thermodynamics, which states that entropy in a system tends to increase over time. Primary producers, mostly plants and algae, form the foundation of ecosystems by converting light energy into chemical energy through photosynthesis. This stored energy becomes available to other organisms in the ecosystem when they're eaten. Some exceptional organisms like bacteria near deep sea vents can produce food through chemosynthesis without using sunlight. Feeding relationships in ecosystems involve producers, consumers, and decomposers. These relationships can be modeled using food chains, food webs, and ecological pyramids. Each approach offers different insights into ecosystem structures and the way those ecosystems work. Your primary producers form the first level, followed by primary consumers, the herbivores. The herbivores are followed by the secondary consumers or the omnivores who eat both herbivores and producers. Then you have your secondary consumers and your tertiary consumers, which tend to be carnivores that eat herbivores. At the side of each of these trophic levels, you have decomposers and decomposers break down organic matter from all the trophic levels and recycling the nutrients back into the system and making them available for the producers. As energy moves through trophic levels, significant amounts are lost as heat. Following the 10% rule, only about 10% of the energy that's available at one trophic level gets passed on or transferred to the next trophic level. The remaining 90% is lost through metabolic processes, movement, and heat production through respiration. This inefficiency limits most food chains to typically four or five trophic levels. Bioaccumulation occurs when persistent pollutants like DDT or mercury build up within an individual organism over time because those substances can't be broken down or excreted by metabolic processes. 
This happens when the rate of intake of that substance exceeds the rate that it is eliminated or degraded. Biomagnification is related to bioaccumulation, but it's distinctly different. Biomagnification refers to the increase in the concentration of these pollutants as those pollutants move higher and higher up the food chain. Since each consumer eats many prey organisms, they accumulate all the pollutants those prey had stored, and that leads to increasingly dangerous concentrations at higher trophic levels. Toxins such as DDT and mercury accumulate along food chains due to this biomagnification process. This diagram shows PCB concentrations increasing dramatically from 0 0.000002 milligrams per liter in seawater to 160 milligrams per kilo in marine mammals. That's an 80 million fold increase in concentration of PCBs. This high concentration of toxins and heavy metals in upper trophic levels is why a lot of doctors advise pregnant women and nursing mothers to avoid eating tuna and other top marine predators. Ecological pyramids are quantitative models that visually represent trophic structure. They typically show a decrease in numbers, a decrease in biomass, and a decrease in energy as we move higher and higher up the trophic chain. And this is what creates the pyramid shape. These are usually measured for a specific area and a specific time period. Let's go through these one by one. A pyramid of numbers simply counts organisms at each trophic level. Interestingly, these can sometimes be inverted, particularly when individuals at lower trophic levels are relatively large. For example, one tree, which is a producer, might support thousands of insects, which are the consumers, and those insects may support dozens of birds, which might then also support one or two predatory birds or other hunters like snakes. A pyramid of biomass represents the total mass of organisms at each trophic level, and this is measured in units like grams per square meter. These typically decrease at higher levels, but can occasionally show greater quantities at higher trophic levels if they're measured at a specific point in time, like during winter months when some of the producers in temperate or polar zones might be dormant. Pyramids of biomass can appear inverted during certain seasons, especially in aquatic ecosystems. This diagram shows how a biomass pyramid changes through seasons as producer populations fluctuate. However, if it's measured over an entire year, the pyramid would show the expected decreasing pattern resulting in that pyramid shape. Pyramids of productivity show the flow of energy through each trophic level. That's the rate at which biomass is generated. You can identify these by the time component in their units, such as kilos per hectare per year, or grams per square meter per year. When you see that per year, you're probably looking at a pyramid of productivity. Unlike biomass pyramids, productivity pyramids for entire ecosystems over a year always show a decrease along the food chain. You can calculate the efficiency of energy transfer between trophic levels. In this example, of the 1,575 grams per square meter per year that's produced by plants, only 235 grams of biomass per square meter per year becomes herbivore biomass. That's an efficiency of about 15% and is relatively close to that 10% rule we addressed earlier in the video. The efficiency generally declines at higher trophic levels due to increasing energy demands for maintenance. In other words, your top predators spend a greater proportion of their energy hunting for moving organisms than the herbivores do wandering the landscape and eating plants that don't run away from them. The laws of thermodynamics govern energy flow in ecosystems. The first law of thermodynamics, which is called the conservation of energy, explains why energy is neither created nor destroyed but it's transformed or it changes forms as it moves through food chains. The second law of thermodynamics, which is the law of increasing entropy, explains why energy becomes less available with each transfer, because much of that energy is lost as heat. A key skill in ESS is constructing models of feeding relationships from data. You might be asked to do this in one of your paper two questions in section A. This table shows population changes in a marine ecosystem over time. You could use this to build food chains or food webs or ecological pyramids showing relationships between kelp, urchins, sea otters, and other species. When constructing system diagrams for processes like photosynthesis and respiration, make sure you include components such as flows, inputs, outputs, transfers, transformations, and storages. And remember on the exam to always write those system diagrams as boxes and arrows.
They're not looking for a sketch of the organisms. You also want to remember that energy flows through a system while matter cycles within it. Many ecosystems cross political boundaries, and this creates international management challenges. Questions arise about who controls water resources, who's responsible for enforcement, who pays for cleanup, and who compensates those who are affected downstream from pollution. From a TOK perspective, it's worth considering how different models represent feeding relationships. When is a food web more appropriate than a simple food chain? When might a pyramid of numbers be more informative than a pyramid of biomass? These kinds of choices influence the way that we understand ecosystem dynamics. That's it for ESS Topic 2.2, Communities and Ecosystems. Thanks for watching, and until next time, happy learning.